Hey everyone, so a while back I talked about the new Intel 8th generation CPUs as potentially one of the most exciting generational leaps in years. Core i5 and i7 would migrate from 4 to 6 cores, 12 threads in total on the i7, a notional 50% increase in basic computational power. But then again, Intel's Skylake X and indeed AMD's Ryzen have come along, both offering plenty of cores, tons of processing power, but relatively little or indeed no improvement for gamers up against the Core i7 7700K. Now today I'm reviewing the 8700K and I can say that it's the many core CPU that gamers have been waiting for. Tons of extra power, a noticeable upgrade for gaming, great overclocking and plenty more besides. But first up, let's take a look at the system I've built to test this CPU. Mainboard wise, ASUS has supplied the Maximus 10 Hero here based on the new Z370 chipset. Yes, it's true, I'm afraid. It's got the same socket as Z270 and indeed Z170, but you can't run 8th gen core CPUs in those older boards, meaning that you need to buy one of these. I mean, people talk about incremental boosts to CPU, but it's actually the boards that are far more of a concern with this generation. You need a new one, point blank. I mean, ASUS has done a great job with everything a motherboard needs to do here. Plenty of I.O., good overclocking control, headers for the increasingly popular all-in-one coolers, RGB lighting, but yes, it is a necessary investment for Coffee Lake. I've used my usual Corsair Vengeance LPX sticks here, rated at 3000 MHz, so all my existing benchmark data transfers over for the comparisons here. Cooling-wise, Corsair has also supplied the H110i GTX all-in-one solution. And if you want to push the 8700K to its limits, I do recommend a seriously meaty thermal solution like this one. So let's kick off with some basic benchmarks, starting off with Cinebench tested in single and multi-core rendering. I've compared the 8700K at stock speeds here with its predecessor, the 6-core 7800X from the Enthusiast Skylake X line, and of course Ryzen 7 1800X. No real surprises here, the 4.7 GHz single core turbo propels it beyond the 7700K, while the extra two cores deliver almost 50% of extra performance. Core and clock refinements versus Skylake X also see higher scores in both single and multi-threaded performance. The top-end Ryzen still commands a lead in multi-thread performance, but it's looking fragile elsewhere. Video encoding with Handbrake then. Now this is the tool that we use ourselves for delivering our video content, and we provide both H.264 and HEVC encodes on our website, digitalfoundry.net. The results here, actually quite remarkable. Of course, the 7700K is history. Video encoding just scales well across lots of cores. But essentially in H.264, the 8700K at stock speeds is a match for Ryzen 7 1800X, and it beats the 6-core i7. HEVC results based on the X265 encoder use AVX instructions extensively. Now this is an area where Intel has dominance over AMD and the results show. Ryzen offers performance a touch faster than the 7700K, but the 8700K has a 25 point lead. Remarkable stuff. These are great results for a chip at stock speeds, showing that the 8700K is pretty awesome for productivity. But what about gaming? Well, that's where we're going to focus, and it's here where the story gets even more fascinating. OK, so let's quickly talk about how we ascertain how fast a CPU is with gaming workloads. Essentially, we pair the processor with an overclocked Titan X Pascal running ultra-level settings at 1080p resolution. The job of the CPU is to process game logic and prepare draw calls for the GPU. So our aim here is to run the highest fidelity simulation on the CPU and send out the densest scenes for the GPU to render. By using Titan X at a relatively low resolution, the GPU is no longer the bottleneck for the most part. Instead, it's CPU and DDR4 system RAM bandwidth. Now, most of the time in a less insane setup, the GPU is the bottleneck, not the CPU. But when buying a processor, it's really all about how much overhead you have. And our tests are about measuring that overhead as best as we can. But even when we do this, sometimes you won't see much difference at all. Case in point, The Division by Ubisoft. I mean, we've got the 8700K up against existing 4, 6 and 8 core CPUs here. And effectively, there's no difference. None. 
Well, okay, by the end of the bench, there's a, a maximum four frames per second delta, but nothing that the human eye can really perceive across the run of play. And sometimes the differentials are there, but very slight, as you can see here in Assassin's Creed Unity. You can perceive KB Lake and Coffee Lake inching ahead of the two Skylake X chips here. But again, the delta is tiny, so who cares? Now, some might say that the differential is there, but largely academic. However, in a test like Ashes of the Singularity CPU benchmark, you do see Coffee Lake having a big, big advantage over its challenges. It beats the 7700K and 7800X, which weirdly have much the same performance profile, and it even monsters the 7820X by a whopping 17%, even though it has two fewer cores. Now, this benchmark is a heavily multi-threaded workload that thrives on cores and frequency, and also L3 cache memory, an area where Skylake X does fall a bit short. Now, we love Crisis 3 for its super reliance on cores and threads, and the 8700K produces some incredible results here. The range of this benchmark is such that we need to kind of compress the grid somewhat to fit everything in. But even so, the Coffee Lake advantage is impossible to ignore in these renders. Areas like this show the 7700K at the bottom of the pile, as you might expect. The two Skylake X is in the middle, but the 8700K is way in front. By the end of the bench, the 8700K is 28% faster than its predecessor, a result that betters Intel's own gaming benchmark, a 25% gen-on-gen boost in Gears of War 4. But it's also 14% faster than the 8-core 7820X. Amazing stuff, but average frame rates only really tell some of the story. Okay, so buying a fast CPU is essentially about overhead, about keeping frame rates as high as possible in the highest stress test scenarios. So let's freeze frame right here. 100 frames per second on the 7700K, 152 on the 8700K. Nice round numbers there, showing the in-the-moment improvement in a CPU-heavy scene. Also note the frame time graph. As we move from four to six to eight cores on the existing Intel chips, the frame times smooth out, and the 8700K offers the smoothest frame times of all. So yeah, Intel talks about 25% increases in gaming performance, and we can replicate that on several titles, but what's really important are those in-the-moment frame rates. Frame times, they're a ton better in the most stressful scenes. And that's what you actually feel when you play. Moving on, The Witcher 3. It's another game that loves threads, bandwidth, and frequency. The lead here is monstrous. 171 FPS on average, a stunning result for our Novigrad City test run, which is one of the heaviest CPU-bound parts of the game. You'll note that the 8-core 7820X is also beaten significantly once again. Nothing gets close to the 8700K. It's remarkable. Finally, let's talk Far Cry Primal. It's a game that actually thrives on single thread power, cache and system memory bandwidth. Skylake X, and I have to say Ryzen 2, well, the many core designs there really struggle with this game. There is no massive leap here with the 8700K. As you can see, it's basically a touch faster than the 7700K. But it illustrates that Intel has delivered a many core design that keeps the strengths of the last gen i7. So even if a game doesn't fully exercise all the cores and threads, it's still got it in terms of pure single core power. Amazing stuff, and remember that this isn't the case with Skylake X or indeed Ryzen. Okay, so all of these tests have been carried out at stock speeds, but there's a lot of overclocking potential here too. First of all, engage the XMP profile for your memory and you get a feature called Enhanced Turbo, which is basically easy overclocking with the board running all cores at the single max core turbo speed, which in this case is a whopping great 4.7 gigahertz. Or if you prefer, go hell for leather and aim for five gigahertz. I did this with 1.32 volts. A bit high for my liking, but heat was contained and the results were great. Let's go back to the benchmarks then and check out the scaling. And this time we'll stack it up against the eight core i7 7820X and the 10 core i9 7900X. Check out the results here. Single thread power is way ahead according to Cinebench and at five gigahertz, it's not a million miles away from the 7820X in terms of multi-thread performance. 
but it's the video encoding that I found really interesting. The 8700K can duke it out with the 7820X in H.264, and it's not a million miles away from the 7900X either. Meanwhile, the super heavy X.265 HEVC tests show a closer grouping of results. Not bad, right? So, what about gaming? I've got stock performance here with 2666MHz RAM stacked up against a 5GHz OC with faster modules. You get a boost, but not a massive one, as you can see here in Crisis 3. Against a maxed out 7700K and a similarly maxed Ryzen 7, well, there's no competition. Now, Ryzen 7 works best with Crisis 3's love for many cores, but whether you're at stock or overclocked, the 8700K screams ahead. The Far Cry Primal benchmark also illustrates many core processors' weakness in single-threaded games, with Ryzen overclocked really struggling here. But again, you'll note that there's not a huge boost with the 8700K at 5GHz. Now, personally, I'd be sticking with all-core turbo and decent memory as a good compromise. But I also noted that memory bandwidth on your DDR4 isn't hugely impactful this time around across our suite of games. Just keep away from slow bargain basement memory at 2133 MHz. Coffee Lake i5s and i7s even allow the locked chips to run with 2666 memory. And that's what I'd recommend as a baseline. This benchmark shows us running stock clocks at 2133, 2666 and 3000 MHz bandwidth. And I've tossed in a 5 GHz overclock running with slower memory. There are two major takeaways from this kind of testing. So here, in the bandwidth-happy Far Cry Primal, there's not a huge delta in performance actually, but faster memory is making a small difference. But the main takeaway is that wasting all of that energy in overclocking does nothing if you don't increase memory bandwidth to match. The Witcher 3 benchmark, we have monsters bandwidth, and once again you can see that faster RAM really is more important than overclocking. These are the kind of results that show the advantages of faster memory to its largest extent. And again, overclocking does nothing without wide bandwidth DDR4. Rise of the Tomb Raider shows more restrained boosts in terms of memory scaling, but once again, 5 GHz overclock is just a waste of power unless you have the memory bandwidth to match it. Okay, and the final big topic I want to cover. Basically, if you already have an i7, should you upgrade? Well, this is a huge gen-on-gen -gen upgrade in my opinion, but I ran some benches showing how older chips compare to the stock 8700K. Now, to make it a fairer fight, I've run them all at 4.5 gigahertz and paired them with fast RAM. I mean, look, even the 3770K still hands in great performance, and there'll be many titles like The Division here where you won't see much, if any, difference. It's a similar situation with AC Unity, though you will note that gaps are starting to appear in those lines as the gen-on-gen -gen increases in both core capability and memory bandwidth start to kick in. Oh, and remember that 2400 MHz is pretty much as far as DDR3 goes. DDR4 still has more to give with many kits that are faster than 3000 MHz, which I've tested here. Crisis 3, yeah, right. I mean, the 8700K is running at stock speeds here, and it's light years ahead. 3770K, 4790K, still good chips, I'd say, but scenes like this really illustrate just how much faster the 8th gen core can be. And it's the same situation with the Ashes of the Singularity CPU test. Ivy Bridge and Devil's Canyon, much of a muchness. The 7700K is basically on par with the 6700K, and here you can see the core and memory bandwidth improvements really shine. But the Coffee Lake 8700K, it is just on another level. So yeah, I'd say that you're getting a really big generational leap here. I mean, productivity performance is great. Overclocking is pretty awesome, but our focus is primarily on gaming and Coffee Lake is delivering the many core experience you'd expect. In fact, the gains are so big, I'm sort of left to wonder just how good is the six core i5 8600K going to be? And then there's the i5 8400, the cheapest six core chip Intel has. I can't wait to test that one out, that's for sure. Okay, so I've got i5 testing to be getting on with, clearly, but in the here and now, I'd say there's a definite excitement level to Coffee Lake, and I'm really looking forward to seeing more. But that's all from me for now. Please do like, subscribe, and indeed share our work to help support what we do. And yes, do follow us on Twitter for the latest Digital Foundry updates. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.